Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. So this is sort of a talk about some of the things we've done over the last couple of years. So if, I go, if you've seen some of it before, if I go too slow, if I go too fast, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to, uh, to change it if you have questions in, in the middle. So maybe just start at the very basics, what is image registration, right? Typically you want to uh, take a source image, deform it to the target image, and then you, op you uh, formulate this as some sort of optimization problem. So the classical setup here is that you minimize some sort of uh, objective function that's a compromise between an irregularity of the transformation, meaning typically you want to get something smooth, and some sort of image mismatch, right? So you want to match well when you minimize it. And you can parametrize these transformations in all sorts of different ways. You can have simple parametric models, but you can also go to these non-parametric models, which I will mostly focus on, where essentially you parametri parametrize these things with uh, vector fields. So why would you want to do this? Well, it used to be that you would want to this, do this, for example, for atlas-based segmentation. I guess I would argue these days, probably this has largely been replaced just doing it straight up by deep learning, but maybe there's still something to it. Um, you probably still want to do this if you want to do some sort of normalized analysis. So if you want to analyze, uh, if you want to analyze changes in some sort of common coordinate system, so you need to bring images to a common coordinate system. If you want to do some sort of tracking, right, let's say how pathology changes, maybe if you do radiation treatment planning, uh, registration is still important. And then I'll touch on this a little bit, and I think um, also uh, Ben talked about this briefly yesterday, and then there's a paper on this on using registration in some form for some form of data augmentation that can help you with, seg with training segmentation models, for example. So just, just as a quick overview, what will this talk be about and what, what will it not be about? So I'll give you a bunch of opinions which may or may not be justified, so feel free to push back. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about registration history, sort of like what we used to do and, and where we're going now. Um, we'll all be at a reasonably high level, but there will be some equations. And uh, as we go through this talk, I'll try to develop some a deep learning registration model that's sort of a little bit less, uh, a little bit more than these classical approaches in the sense that it has some theoretical guarantees at test time, and it also tries to estimate how you should regularize a transformation. So it's trying to push there. I will not talk a whole lot about deep learning architectures. I just assume they're given. That's not my, my focus here. And uh, so I will focus on the loss functions that are used to train these models. And I will also not give you lots of quantitative results. I'll, I'll just try to give you sort of the high level overview. So what, what did we, we used to do? Well, we used to do a lot of stuff just by optimization with pairs of images. And now we push towards these deep, deep learning registration based models. So I'll give you a bunch of points of sort of like what classically has been done in the last couple of decades and what has sort of emerged over the last couple of years. So I think the first important point to make is that it used to be the vast majority of registration uh, methods, maybe with the exception of Atlas building, was to look at pairwise image registration. So you have pairs of images and that's it. You put your model on it and, and you do something with these pair of images. Now it's really trying to do something with entire image populations. And um, this has certain benefits in the sense that you can learn something about the space that these registrations should be living in in the first place. Um, we also used to um, be, guide, be guided, we, we, we write down mathematical models and oftentimes they were motivated by a, sort of like a mixture between um, what you would like to do and was, what was mathematically convenient in terms of like what you could write down and easily optimize. A lot of these things I think have now become much more flexible because we can do everything with these deep learning toolboxes. You can use automatic differentiation and you can write down really complicated models. So some of these models uh, I think that I'm going to talk about today, sure you, can, you, could, you could approach them in the way people used to do them, but I think it would be rather error prone and, and uh, kind of complicated. So I think even if you don't do deep learning, if you're in registration, if you use these deep learning toolboxes, I think they're a powerful tool just for very rapid prototyping because you really can focus on the model rather than on the nitty gritty uh, behind the scenes details if you want to play around with them a little bit. Um, solutions used to be rather slow, right? Because, uh, because everything is based on potentially very high dimensional optimization. And now when you do this with these deep networks, you get to much faster solutions. Training may be very slow, right? The training time, but at test time, you're just evaluating a regression model essentially. So you can get blazingly fast registrations, and I'll show you some of these results where you can do 3D, 3D volume registrations in a matter of a few seconds if you want to. Uh, the question that arises here is that anything you train here on, on these loss functions, uh, typically you have control at 
constraining because you're minimizing some sort of loss, but it's not really clear what the control you have over at test time, right? And if you if you went to Tom's talk yesterday, this connects a little bit in the sense when he ta was talking about like having segmentations and manually correcting them. If you do this in a naive way, I mean, you can sort of like retrain the network, but may not respect what you want to do. So it's the same kind of uh, setup, right? Maybe you can do something in these registration models where you try to construct them in such a way that they retain certain properties also at test time and not only during training. Um, yeah, it sort of goes in, this in the same direction. So for example, people used to make a pretty big deal out of having diffeomorphic transformations. If this is what you want, sometimes it's good, sometimes maybe not. Uh, the, the models that I'm going to talk about will, uh, about will have this guarantee, but it's the same story, right? I mean, if you do something and you predict something with, with regression, you may want to have this control over this regularity of transformations also at test time and not only at training. And if you construct it in, a, uh, in, a, in the appropriate way, I think you can, you can do this. So wha what will I talk about in this remainder of this talk? It's really um, two things mostly and then a little bit of an outlook and an overview of some other things we've done. First of all, when you do um, these registration problems, when you try to set them up, in the vast majority of the cases, what you assume is that the spatial transformation that you're looking for is in some sense smooth and it's in some sense uniformly smooth, meaning that the smoothness penalty you put on at every location is the same, right? And this is a, this is a nice model in the sense that it's simple, but might not be the most realistic model if you have sort of like different tissues or if, if, uh, if some parts of the space have um, uh, a higher desire to move uh, far than, than others. And so um, it might be useful to have models that, that break this assumption. And then, as I said, uh, typically they have, you have relatively limited guarantees at test time. And I'll try to, to walk you through one possible approach. There are, of course, others to try to get around this a little bit. So essentially, what I'm going to push for is something where you have a source and a target image. You'll have a warped source, and you also get some sort of map of like the estimated regularity, right? And and so it estimates like the how space should be locally regularized, how smooth it is, and and this comes all from the data that you look at, right? You can probably at this point already appreciate that this is no way something you could do if you only look at it from this paradigm of having one source and one target image. You really need the population for this because otherwise you have no way to get at this information. So most of the this, this things I'm talking about here is available as PyTorch code if you want to um, check some of this out. Uh, also, there's sort of like a base registration library that uh, implements all of these optimization-based approaches. So let's first talk about parameterization. So if you want to predict registration with a neural network, what do you want to predict? So um, the idea here is really quite simple, right? And, and uh, so you have a source and a target image. You go through some sort of black box, and out, should, uh, out comes your transformation. And the choices that you have here is, first of all, what quantity you want to predict, and then how do you want to do the prediction or the regression. And then, of course, in the end, is the prediction you get is it good enough, right? Because you can predict something, but if it's sort of way worse than what you would get with your classical methods, probably you haven't really won a whole lot. Maybe speed, but, but that, would be, that would be about it. So the what we're going to do the prediction with, of course, is a deep neural network. But you could probably replace this with some sort of other regression model. And the choices that we're going to consider here first are these non-parametric approaches to parameterize a, a transformation, meaning that uh, it's all based on some vector field. And these vector fields then have different meanings depending on how you parameterize. For example, the vector field could be directed at really the displacement field that you're interested in. Uh, it could be a, a velocity field that you integrate through. And this integration through the velocity field then, of course, allows you to get some regularities of the transformation. So to, for example, to avoid folding if it's, if it's smooth enough. Or you can go even more indirectly to predict the vector field, something called the momentum field, where essentially there's a vector field that then gets smoothed to get the velocity field. And then you integrate through the velocity field. And this is sort of mostly what I'm going to be talking about. If you've never seen this before, uh, bear with me for a few minutes. I'll give you like a very short uh, intro to how this works. So for this, let's briefly talk about a model called LDDMM. And then, uh, so I'll introduce this. I'll take a step back later to something slightly more simple. But it's just to illustrate uh, where this is going in terms of how the, how the registration model is formulated and uh, what kind of properties this may have. So if you, if you look at LDDMM, this stands for Large Displacement Diffeomorphic Metric Mo uh, Mapping Model. It's actually it's probably, let's say, about 20, 
20, 30 years old, this model. So it's, it's, it's not, uh, but it's a, a nice model because it looks at it from sort of an optimal control point of view. So what's the setup here? The setup is really you want to find a time-dependent velocity field, so a velocity field that, that changes in space and time. That if you flow along this velocity field, basically just along uh, according to this equation, which gives you the spatial transformation, if you flow along this velocity field you at unit time, you can deform the source image so that it matches the target image as well as possible. Right? And of course, there, there could be an infinite number of different options of how you flow. Mm -hmm. So you need to somehow penalize what you consider a good velocity field. And this penalty is typically some form of like Sobolev norm. And you integrate this uh, over time. Right? So you want to have, in some sense, a shortest path. Um, if you see, we see this from the point of view of like driving your car from point A from to point B, maybe you want minimum energy consumption, so you go at, 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 the, uh, at the same speed and don't constantly accelerate and brake. And here it's the same kind of thing. So you have a velocity field that in some sense should be small with respect to this norm. And then when you apply this transformation, it should warp the source image to the target image. And there's a compromise again between these two terms. This is the regularity term and this is the image similarity term. If there's anything unclear, please stop me, yes? Oh, um, can I mean just for notation, so yeah. do you really concatenate V and phi? I mean, like, V is the velocity, phi is the transformation, right? Oh, no, this is just, uh, it's, it's yeah. oops, sorry. This is just uh, uh, a V, a, a sort of V of phi. Oh, okay. Sorry, this is the notation, yeah. Oh. I'm not concatenating them as, as maps, yeah. Okay, so sorry, yeah. Maybe, maybe this notation, yeah. Yeah, I'm solving an ODE. Uh, essentially, this just means, maybe the notation is a bit unlucky, but essentially it just means you have a point and you, and you flow it along the velocity field. So if you formulate this, I mean, you can, you can also formulate this, uh, and I think it's easier if you, if you go uh, about it in this way, where you just say instead of like solving directly for the transformation, you just say you can just take the image and you flow it according to this advection equation. It's essentially the same. And so if you start from this formulation, you can compute what the optimality conditions are, right? So what do you do? You just compute the first variation, um, see um, when this goes away, and you end up with this triplet of equations. So the triplet of equations is you, ha you have in your forward model, you just flow the image according to the velocity field. <coughs> then uh, the adjoint equations is just the scalar conservation law. And if, if you want to look at this from the deep learning paradigm, this is essentially a continuous version of error backpropagation. Right? So this, this lambda is essentially the error that's backpropagated over time. And then you have something that couples all of these quantities together, <coughs> the velocity field, the, in this particular case, the scalar momentum, that's what it's also called, the Lagrangian multiplier, and then uh, the gradient of the image. So there are a couple of important things to note here. First of all, this quantity, lambda gradient i, is also something called uh, the vector volume momentum. And you go from this momentum to the velocity, by applying this particular operator. And this operator essentially, you can just think of it as, as a smoothing of the momentum field. So the velocity field will be very smooth. The momentum field doesn't have to be. And what's interesting about this also, it can be written as sort of a product between a scalar field and a vector field. So that means if the gradient of the image is zero, for example, if you would do this on, sha on binary shapes, there will be no momentum by construction. And at optimality, these equations need to hold, subject to some sort of boundary conditions that I have suppressed here. But uh, you can also, what you can also do is you can run this entire model forward in time. Then it's a geodesic equation for this transformation. And essentially, if you know the initial image I0 and the initial momentum lambda, it gives you the whole transformation across time. So you can, these are the geodesic, you can use them for something called shooting, right? So then you're not optimizing over the entire spatial temporal velocity field anymore. You're just optimizing over the initial conditions. And what you can also do, which I think is quite interesting, is if you have this momentum, you can take this equation system and write it in this particular form. And this equation is something called the euler poincare equation for diffeomorphisms. And, uh, and then it's only about the transformation itself, parameterized by, the, by this momentum vector field. There's no mention of the image anymore, right? You can use this equation really to describe deformation of space. You can, with the space deformation, move points around surfaces, images, whatever you want. Uh, it can be written in this particular form. Good, good question. Yes. So the compressed L is that, that's coming from the subvelocity. Yes, system. yes. And in that case, either we end up with the integral equation in this case? Sorry, what? Integral equation in this case? In the what equation? Uh, L. Oh, this dagger? Yeah. Oh, it's just the adjoint. So that means 
actual calculation is based on the integral equation or? Uh, no, so, so this is a differential operator, right? So, so it could be something like first derivative minus two times the second derivative. But in practice, what people oftentimes do is because V is sort of, if, if V is given as the inverse of this opto operator applied to M and it's a smoothing operator, oftentimes the starting point is that you just assume you have a ma momentum field and then you smooth it with a Gaussian or a multi-Gaussian, for example. This, this, is, this is what I'm going to do later on. There's, there's no, there's no int integral in this. Okay, it's so it's just a... There is a differential, but with the uh, data together, it will be like a, some kind of filter then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a filter, exactly. And, and, and essentially, the filter is if you take the inverse and if you apply this inverse of this operator to M, it will be a smoothing operation. Okay. And so oftentimes, you just start by defining the smoothing operations in this particular setup. And as you'll see later, I'll, I'll essentially use a, a multi-Gaussian, so a mixture of Gaussians for smoothing. Okay. Other questions? OK. So this, this is what this looks like, for example. right? You started the identity map, and then you move in some sort of, I mean, doesn't need, this is not a sphere, of course. You move in some sort of space, and so you can express this deformation of space just based on initial conditions. Right? You, you just imagine, like in a, in a simpler case, if you have a line, you just specify the initial slope, and you know where the line goes. Here you, you specify the initial momentum, and it parameterizes the transformation. And the nice thing is, if, if you're smoothing it sufficiently enough, so if your differential operator is strong enough, then at least in theory, uh, you should get diffeomorphic transformations, no matter how far you integrate it out. In practice, I'm saying in theory, right, because in practice at some point there comes the point where you discretize this and the discretization may wreak havoc there a little bit, but let's just assume we have the perfect discretization and the theory holds and everything stays diffeomorphic. So everything is encoded in the initial conditions. So now, now you want to, um, uh, I guess, uh, the prediction that uh, uh, what, what we're going to try to do here is we, we predict the initial momentum of this LDDMM, the vector momentum. And uh, the nice thing, uh, this ha uh, the nice property this has, if you do this, is that you predict it, but then the velocity that you that you get is obtained from this mo momentum by smoothing. And so you do this after the fact, right? No matter what the m here is, if you if you predict it reasonably well, you s the the, the neural network doesn't need to learn about the smoothing. The smoothing comes after the fact, and then you integrate the equation out. So you still sort of like retain these properties of getting diffeomorphic transformations at test time, not only during training, because you're not going directly for the prediction of a displacement field, for example. You're going for the prediction of the momentum, and things happen after the effect. I'll, I'll give you a little bit more intuition of what this means in a second. So if you would want to see if this matters, I mean, you could just stick it into your favorite neural network. Uh, I mean, this is sort of like the first one we tried back in the days, but you could use something different. And then we have source image, target image, you can do this with patches, or we now do it with the entire images. And then you predict these vector fields. Right? Vector field, either displacement field, <laughs> velocity field, or momentum field. In our case, we'll predict the momentum field. And then what's sort of like hidden here um, is you would integrate the PDE out. And if you train it end to end, then the PDE itself becomes part of your overall model. And you backprop through the entire thing. Right? Something like this, I mean, to come back to my point earlier, something like this, I would not want to manually write, write down the optimality conditions for. But if you do it with PyTorch or probably with TensorFlow, it's not a big deal. You can do it. So does this work in practice? Well, here's an example 2D result, and I'll have a 3D result in the next slide. The source image, target image, this is one LDDMM result, maybe not the perfect parameters, but, but it sort of like pushes the source image reasonably close to the, sorry. Yeah, it's reasonably close to the target image. And then if you predict it with, with LDDMM, with the model that I just talked about in this particular case with patches, you get something that, that looks uh, very close. But, but because this is sort of like a, a funky image here in comparison, it's not, it's not perfect. If you want to, you can do some sort of sampling. So we did some sort of sampling with dropout here. Then you get a bunch of predicted momenta, integrate this bunch of predicted momenta out, and then, then compute sort of uncertainty maps. Like blue, you're relatively certain. Red, you're, you're pretty uncertain. And so it highlights, I think, regions that seem to be reasonable where maybe you should be a little bit cautious in this, in this prediction. So, so you, can, you can play these kinds of tricks. You can also do this, as I said, in 3D. Uh, the results to the uh, are very, very similar, at least visually. And uh, you'll see in a second also quantitatively to the optimization result, where you really do this very high dimensional optimization over this uh, initial vector field for the momentum. But it's orders of magnitude faster, right? So where maybe before you need required like 10, 15 minutes on a GPU, you can do this now in a, in a, few, in a few seconds. 
The thing, of course, is that it's in reality a little bit more complicated, right? Because you talk about these models, and this deformable part is now very fast, but maybe your bottleneck is now the affine registration. So uh, that being said, I have, I'm not really talking about this, but you can also, of course, have models that predict your affine part, and then, and then you can do everything fast, so you can integrate this. But, but the thing is that uh, these uh, deformable registration uh, models are faster than typical affine registration when you do it by optimization. So, so you may, worry, may, may need to worry about uh, other problems in your, in your processing pipeline. So what about accuracy? So we did some sort of, <coughs> we did some sort of evaluation on one of these, uh, actually on four different data sets. I'm just showing you one here. These are different registration algorithms. This is brain registration. Uh, on the y-axis target overlap ratio, and these red ones are sort of L always optimization based, LDDMM, LP is with this prediction, and this is with an additional correction step. And what you see here is that uh, essentially gets um, results that are, that are similar to, um, to, to, to state-of-the-art optimization based algorithms like SPM or, or, or ANT, actually ANTS is the SYN here. But what you also should see is that this performance of these algorithms, at least on this particular data set, they are all not very good, right? Because ideally, you'd want to be um, at one, which is somewhere up in the roof here. And uh, the, these, these algorithms, they, they do a decent job at registration, but, but they're not perfect. And I think, uh, they're, I think there are two possible reasons for this. One reason is that the manual segmentations are probably not perfect. They're a little bit um, uh, noisy. But probably also, um, these algorithms don't really achieve uh, perfect registration results because some of these registrations are, in fact, difficult. So maybe let's take a little bit of a step back and talk about what is nice about this momentum prediction in the first place. Right? I, I told you one particular nice thing that if you do the smoothing after the prediction of the momentum, at least in theory, you can retain some of these theoretical guarantees that you still get diffeomorphic transformations. Um, Performance-wise, it looks okay, right? but though not something necessarily that blows me out of the water. I mean, it's fast, but, but it uh, has similar kind of performance. But um, let's, let's take a step back and see why predicting momentum may, may be a nice thing to do. So if you look at one-on-one registration, let's say you have this gray square, small one, big one, you want to register them to each other. Then the points that really, um, I would argue, you don't have a, a big issue in terms of finding correspondences are the corner points. The edge points are already a little bit ambiguous. And whatever happens on the inside is entirely driven by the, by the regularization. Right? It's this famous aperture problem. And so um, this, uh, why, why is this an issue when you do predictions? Well, if you would have some sort of displacement field that, that, that's everywhere, and you just uh, predict based on like a little patch, because let's say you predict patch-wise, or maybe your, um, your, your, your region where the, the network looks based on the size of the filters you have in the network is relatively small, then it's difficult to predict something um, in this particular, just by looking at information in this pa particular region, right, because you don't have enough spatial context. So it's not easily possible if you would directly want to predict displacement of velocity field based on this little patch. However, if you do this with the momentum, there's no real issue, right, because as you might recall from what I, what I described earlier, this vector momentum is a product between a scalar and a vector. So um, I don't really know what the scalar is, but I know that in a uniform region of an image, this gradient is zero. Hence, the momentum is also zero. So if you're in a uniform region, you don't really need to worry about predicting the momentum because you can just predict zero. If you're in a region with texture, then it's fine, right? Because in a texture, you get some sort of um, uh, information from the image of what uh, might possibly correspond. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's useful. So if you look at this in a practical um, application, where you look at this registration problem from here to here, and you look at what the initial momentum is, ideally it should only be supported on these edges. It's a little bit smeared out numerically, but this momentum, x and y component, velocity, x and y component, displacement. And then if you would just want to predict it based on this patch, then you see for the momentum in this area at zero, for the others, because it's, it's, it's smoothed out, there is some sort of value, but you can't really predict this easily, right? So if you, I mean, to make, to make this maybe a little bit more concrete, I would imagine, and we haven't really done this test, I would imagine if you, if you, if you do this on natural images, like brain images or lung images or whatnot, it probably doesn't really matter that much because there's always some sort of texture going on. But let's say you would want to deal with um, images that are, uh, that are um, represented as binary images, so essentially shapes, 
I could imagine, though I haven't done the experiment, that you, you, you run into issues when, when you would want to predict displacement fields or velocity fields because you just don't really know what to do. So the nice thing then is if you predict the momentum here, you can predict zero. And then all the regularity that needs to happen just happens also at test time because you smooth it after the fact. So, so all sounds pretty good, right, so far. But the problem is that so far we really only replicating the behavior of LDDMM or other registration models. It's faster, great. I'm very happy about the fact that it's faster, but that's about it, right? So the performance is not that much better at this point. And there also, so, so the question is, can you do something a little bit more interesting, right? Either increasing the performance, and I think you can do something about this. I have one slide a little bit later that points in this direction, or maybe create a more flexible model that even though the overlap measures may not be better, at least tries to tease out some additional information that other registration models may not have available in, in, in this sense. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, drive towards this. So for me, LDMM is sort of a nice model, but yes. So, so far, the, what is your loss function you're using? You're trying to really replicate LDMM, or you have, your, you have an image similarity as a loss function? Uh, so far, the loss function is really the LDMM loss function, meaning there's an image similarity term, like normalized cost correlation or sum of square differences. But then there's also some sort of loss on the momentum, the momentum itself. So essentially, this Sobolev norm, right, and it just defines sort of like an additional condition just to make sure it doesn't try to predict some sort of a, a crazy initial momentum. But this is the loss function, right? Just it's essentially, from a deep learning perspective, you could say it's rather boring, right? Because you have the same model that you always had, and you, and you just predict the initial condition for it. Other questions? So, so, f so for me, this LDMO model is a little bit, uh, I mean, rigid in quotes because it's a fluid model. It's sort of like a nice mathematical model, but, but you sort of like stick to the model. If you would do it directly do some sort of like uh, regression approach, that's nice, but maybe sometimes a little bit too flexible, I would imagine, because it can just do whatever it wants. So where I want to be is somewhere in the middle, right? I want to build some sort of um, scaffolding of uh, saying I have a model that I'm reasonably happy with, maybe not totally happy, but I want to change something, right? And uh, so if you go back to this model, there are different things you could change, right? I mean, you could, you could probably do things like when, when you talk, uh, uh, attended these reconstruction talks, people talked about these variational networks where they essentially unroll some sort of iterative scheme. You could probably do something with this too. This is not what we did. But you could also change out other parts of this equation, right? So I would argue that like the, f the first equation is probably relatively uncontroversial because this is just how the image moves around the velocity field. I don't really see why I would need to learn this. Um, the other equation is sort of directly tied to this because it's the adjoint. So I'm not really sure something should be learned there either. But uh, so the natural candidate then is this third equation in the sense uh, if, if, if some aspect of it could be learned. And the uh, natural thing to try to start learning is, is this regularizer, right? So, is, so far, mostly this is done by mathematical convenience. You don't really know any better, so you, so you pick something. Um, but, but I want to learn this also from data. And uh, essentially, you want to have something, for example, that takes the momentum or the image and then learns how to give me a, a smooth velocity field. And uh, this raises a bunch of issues that, that I'm going want to try to step here through and um, explain what, uh, what we do here. But uh, is essentially, this, 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 is, this is what I'm driving towards. So I want to have the same model as before, learn eventually how to predict these initial conditions, but also learn something about the regularity of what does the data support in terms of like how much smoothing should there happen in different locations, and, and learn all of this from a big population of image pairs. So the first thing issue that arises here is you can do that. You implement it, you get some sort of result, you get excited or not, but you have no idea what you actually should, should, be, sh should be finding. So, so it's a little bit uh, uh, disconcerting. So, so the first thing I did, the, hence, is I, I wrote some sort of simulator that creates a lot of pairs of these, of these artificially formed images. And these images are source images, target images, and then I impose different uh, levels of regularity in these different regions. So basically I say this is very regular, so I smooth it a lot in this sort of like uh, outer ring part, it's a little bit more permissive, so, so, it, so it, can, it, can, it, uh, it allows to, to move more. And then the inner part again is a little bit stiffer, right? And, and uh, the, I, I can, because I have a simulator, I can create a lot of pairs. And now I want to see, can I estimate the deformations and can I estimate something about these regularity properties? And uh, um, the 
just to make the model initially simpler, I took a step back and I didn't do the full-fledged LDDMM. I essentially do a stationary velocity field where I assume the velocity field is fixed. Um, there's no uh, EPDIF equation. I'm just, once I have the velocity field, I just integrate essentially this equation or the transport equation on the image. And, uh, but I also penalize it in the sense that I'm predicting the momentum field or estimating the momentum field and I say I'm, I'm getting the um, velocity field by smoothing the momentum field. And then I want to see if I, if, if I can recover some uh, aspects of this. Uh, to be able to do this, of course, uh, you need to have um, some, uh, define some sort of notion of how you even want to go about uh, parameterizing this sort of like class of uh, smoothness that you want to consider. Again, you could go about it in, in the sense of like having a totally general neural network that predicts how the smooth velocity field should look like from the momentum. Um, maybe that's possible. We haven't tried this. We wanted to start a little bit simpler. And the simpler thing we started, uh, tried to start, we, we start started from something called a, a multi-Gaussian regularizer. I think there's a convolution sign missing, where essentially you're saying you take the momentum and you get to the smooth velocity field by smoothing it with a mixture of Gaussians. And so the mixture weights sum up to one, and you have a bunch of Gaussians at different scales, and, and you decide on the weights, and then, then you would smooth it. Right? So this exists, but this is again, this is done sort of like globally. So we wanted to um, give uh, to estimate sort of locally changing mixtures of Gaussians. So I, I, I pick a set of uh, Gaussians, and then I locally um, try to predict the mixture weights from which I get this. And there's a little bit, actually, there's a, there's a little bit going on behind the scenes, which I'm also going to put uh, Turkish carpet over, just like Enda did yesterday. But essentially, you could say the simplest thing is you, you just make them spatially dependent here. If you do this, it might be possible that it's in theory still diffeomorphic. We were not able to prove it. But if you do it in this form, where you take the momentum field, multiply it by the square root of this wi of x, then smooth it, and then multiply it again, then you can prove it, assuming that these weights also get smoothed a little bit. So if you do this, then, 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 then you can assure it. So the setup here then is really, we want to predict from the data, not only the initial momentum field, but also the mixture weights. And uh, of course, if you predict the mixture weights, then the question is, what are good mixture weights? Right? And, and uh, again, you have something that's sort of uh, way over parameterized with a vector field at the beginning already you try to take this ambiguity out of it by, by smoothing it, but now you introduced even more ambiguity because, because now I have all of these mixture weights. So to get around this a little bit, I mean, you can forget about this equation, at least intuitively what we were saying is that when in doubt, try to explain it with the simplest possible transformation. So what's the simplest possible transformation is probably assigning all the weights to the Gaussian with the, with the largest standard deviation, the one that smooths most. So what we, what we do is essentially, let's say if you have, would have four Gaussians, and you have weights for these Gaussians that need to sum up to one. We just, we just regard this as a discrete distribution, and then we just d define some sort of optimal mass transport penalty on this, but we say the, the cheapest one is the one where everything is assigned to the Gaussian with the, the, all the way to the Gaussian with the largest standard deviation, and the most costly one is the one where everything is assigned to the one that uh, has the smallest standard deviation, where you can do crazy deformations, and so you get penalties in the middle. And then if you want to, you can, you can also add some sort of additional terms where you say, hey, maybe you want these weights to be um, uh, spatially sort of like uniform. You can put some total variation on it, or you can put some other penalties if you have some sort of ideas of what you expect these weight distributions to be. But that's essentially the setup, right? And so then, then you can optimize for the fixed weights. Maybe you can optimize for the spatially constant weights just to get some sort of reasonable starting point. And then you learn a CNN model like a very simple one uh, to, to try to predict these mixture weights. And does this work? Well, in the end, it does sort of work. So if you have the source and a target image here, this is the warped source, for an example. Uh, this is the, the deformation grid, and this is sort of like these, um, uh, these regular, the regularized estimated. So what you see here is essentially the standard deviation of the Gaussian mixture. So if it's blue, it's lower. And if it's yellow, it's higher. So we started out with this example where this outer ring here is, uh, as I said, a little bit more permissive. So the regularizer is, is weaker, so it can do stronger deformations. And, and then the outside on the inside, uh, there was stronger regularization. And it may not have discover, recovered this perfectly, but, but it sort of got the gist of it. And if you, and if you feel like uh, underwhelmed by this result, 
I encourage you to try this at home because it's actually not that easy to get. I was kind of impressed that it was able to tease this out because if you look at the deformations themselves, visually there's no real way to, 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 to pick this up. I mean, you could argue maybe, and I haven't done this experiment either, maybe you could just take your, your favorite registration method and then afterwards just look at, the, at how much it locally deformed. Maybe it would tease out something similar, I'm not sure. But, but it was able to, um, to estimate something that was consistent with, uh, with what the simulation gave you. And then if you do it in practice, you, you can also do this. And then the question, so th these, 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 re these grids, they look a little bit irregular here. But the point is that if you do this in practice, you, 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 you recover some sort of structure that might have useful information. We haven't really pushed this any f uh, very far yet. But, but, but it is the case that, that, it, that it identifies certain regions that seem to have more evidence for irregularity than others. I think I'm just gonna, um, gonna leave this here. So what is, what is still missing here? Is there still something missing? I would argue um, from a theoretical point, uh, yes, because one thing that's sort of a little bit unnatural is that all these results, and maybe this also explains why the results look the way they look, all these results that I've shown you so far they have tried to use this simpler model with the stationary velocity field. Right? And stationary velocity field is a nice model because it's relatively simple. But at the same time, if you have large deformations, it's somewhat unnatural, right? Because here it's sort of like an illustration of a source target image toy example. And here, how, here you see how it's deformed and how the grid deforms. But the parameterization is really some sort of static momentum field or velocity field. It doesn't change, right? So if you have something that sort of like keeps moving, in, in, a, in a sense, this parameterization is fixed and somehow needs to explain this. It gets a little bit washed out, right? Because it cannot really move with the object. So if you, if you compare this to something like, um, <coughs> to compare this to something like LDDMM, I mean, this is actually not standard LDDMM. This is something we call RDDMM because you see sort of how the, how the regularity also moves with the object. But what you, what you should note here is that this momentum sort of like moves with the deforming object and it's in a sense much sharper so uh, from, the, uh, from the model point of view. So what's missing then uh, for us and, and what, what we worked on for a little bit is we try to see if you can have these sort of like LDDMM-like models with, uh, with um, regularizers that you um, estimate and that may, uh, may change uh, spatially. <laughs> But then also the, that the regularizer itself moves, moves as the space deforms, right? So, so this, this pushes it a little bit farther from the, um, from the original model. I don't really want to belabor the point here that much. I mean, if you want to, you can look at the paper and we, ha we have the derivation in there. But it's sort of interesting to see what this does to the model when you, when you, do, the, um, when you do the derivation, right? Remember this, EP, this LDDMM model was all given by this uh, EPDIF, by this all poor Carré equation for diffeomorphism. So that means the whole spatial transformation is essentially described by the initial condition of this momentum field M, and you solve this partial differential equation. Now, when you, when you go to this more general formulation, where you say you have a regularizer that changes in space, and the regularizer moves with the image because something moves, and you sort of how want to track this, then the equation changes, but it changes in a way where the whole left-hand side uh, uh, remains, and you get some sort of like weird uh, right-hand side that has to do with the how how much you um, you smooth these these weights just to make sure they're not too irregular. Um, this the smoothing itself of this uh, of this momentum. And then this uh, gradient hi, hi are these, these pre-weights, so essentially these weights that are smoothed a little bit. So you see then if you would have weights that are constant in space, this term would drop out and you're back to the original EPDIF equation. So I think I'm going way too fast over this equation and I don't really want you to follow the details here. But the point is you can derive a model that's sort of like a generalization of this LDDMM model that has LDDMM, this Euler-Poincaré equation, as a special case. And it allows you to... Um, to, um, to have regularizers that can vary spatially and that move with the, with the, with the deforming object. And uh, if you want to, you can then put everything together. And we've also done this where you have a model that, um, that predicts then with a deep network, the initial momentum, the, um, the, the weights that, that, that give you locally the, the mixture weights of this multi-Gaussian. This predict is also predicted, and then it integrates out this particular differential equation, and it backs backprops through the entire thing. So it's then in the end you have your 
favorite similarity measure, right? Could be just based on images, could be based something on images and segmentation, whatever you want. But you can do this with this rather complex model if you want to. And here are a bunch of examples. So this was not a total variation regularized on the weight, but if this is a knee image. You see a source and a target and a warped image. And then what was estimated here is that uh, that it wanted to um, have a little bit more freedom in terms of deforming things at these particular locations of the knee, and I think this sort of makes sense, right? I mean, probably there's more variability that you see sort of at these interfaces of the bone than on the inside of these bones, and then also on, on the outside. So I'm not sure exactly what the best use case for this methodology is, but I find it sort of interesting that when you take this more population point of view and you, e and you estimate something over large sets of images, you can tease out information um, that has to do with how much regularity the data seems to support based on the model that you impose there. So I have a few more minutes, and in this few more minutes, I'll, I'll give you some, a little bit of additional observations that go beyond what I've talked about in this model, and more, maybe also a little bit more general about um, registration and, uh, and deep learning. So the first thing is, of course, when you do any registration with deep learning or not, if you have like these very complicated registration problems, here's between CT and cone beam CT, images look very different, organs change a lot. If you drive everything just by the images, it might be very complicated, right? Because a standard image similarity that measure like, uh, like SSD or normalized cross correlation and mutual information has absolutely no idea what it should focus on, right? These are nice measures, but they're sort of global, but, but, but there's no notion of what really matters in the image. So in the extreme end, what you could say, well, if you know what matters in the image and you just segment these parts, and probably if you use the segmentation to drive the registration, you'll do a, you'll do a better job. And there are a bunch of papers of people that have explored this, including also some, uh, some of my students. And of course, even in classical registration, if you use images and segmentation, then by construction, you'll probably align, the, align these, the, uh, these uh, models better because you, you make it more problem specific. You essentially tell the registration algorithm these are the areas I really care about. The problem is that in practice, you might not have these segmentations at, uh, uh, for, for all of these images. Uh, maybe image appearances differ. And uh, sure, you might want something fast that we can deal with with these deep networks. But uh, the nice thing is that also not having segmentations at test times is something that, that you can do with these um, deep networks. Because these deep networks can learn things right, that they see during training and then you might not need it at test time. And I think this is really, without going too much into detail here, this is really sort of like one of the benefits of, of doing this with these machine learning approaches, because opposed to these classical registration approaches where you have two images and then maybe two images with segmentations, when you learn it over an entire population, there may be some data that you have <coughs> available during training, but not necessarily a testing, but it can somehow give you a model of deformation that's a little bit more reasonable and can help you to, to learn good transformation models. As a case in point, like the, the very first paper we've, we've, we've or like actually the journal version of the very first paper we've done on this in 2017, we were sort of uh, curious to compare how the performance of this deep network was in comparison to just straight up numerical optimization. And we did this on one of these standard uh, um, registration um, uh, brain image data sets that are, that are out there. I mean, they're all relatively small, but they're standard, so we compared against those. And it turned out that for some of these images, it seemed to do a horrible job. It seemed to be very different. And so, so we looked at these images, and it turns out that one of the reasons why it was so different is that these images, they had sort of like a poor version of brain extraction, so the brain extraction didn't work that well. So if you then do registration between a brain image that has been extracted well and another one that's not that extracted well, if you do this with your favorite optimization approach, that method doesn't really know that this is the case, so we'll just go for it. It will push as hard as possible, we'll make this transformation, and it might not be realistic. Right? If you, and if you, if you do this with a deep network, what happens is that behind the scenes, if you want to or not, it's going to learn some sort of essentially statistical model of what the deformation space is. And this can be good in the sense that it might avoid uh, doing transformations it has never seen. So in that sense, it's not going to like push like crazy uh, trying to um, uh, align structures that are not, not supposed to correspond because they're different in these two images. But of course, this can also potentially be a bad thing, right? Because if, if there would be some case that you want to capture and it has not been in your data, it might, might refuse to do that as well. So I think this is just sort of like a high level comment in the sense that 
it has a nice behavior in the sense that um, it captures somehow the, the space of deformations that it has seen and it uses them to construct a new transformation when it predicts. Uh, but the question is, do you like to be nice, right? So in some cases, maybe, maybe you, you don't want this property. Um, what I also wanted to say is, as I said earlier, if you use a standard similarity measure, then uh, oftentimes you don't really know what, uh, what the registration should focus on. So if you drive it with additional segmentations, you could potentially do much better. But if you sort of like combine registration and segmentation, these things can reinforce each other. We've done some, some work on this in, at, at Mikai where we, last year, where we tried to jointly train a segmentation in the registration network. Um, Ender has some work at IPMI. I think Ben had something at Mikai. And then uh, I think some one of, one of Adrian Dalcha's students also had some work. They essentially all go a little bit in the direction if, if you wish, that, that it uses registrations of potentially uh, images that are unlabeled to give you some form of intelligent data augmentation, if you want to call it like that. And here in this particular case, this is an, the, again, this is an image of the knee. And if you're interested, it's sort of like in registering the cartilage. If you just drive this based on the images, and if you don't have a whole lot of images to train on, then um, in some cases, you might do a very poor job. But if you jointly train a segmentation and registration network, you can get away with very few images for training. So what, what these images here um, show is this, this, is an Im this is an example where you just train the uh, registration network and it uses the image and uh, then labels for, for 200 images. And you do a pretty decent job at, at doing this registration. It looks, it looks good after registration. If you just do this with um, with like um, five, um, uh, just directly the registration or just with, with, with five images, you get sort of like these really weird deformations because it couldn't properly learn this. But if you do it in a way where you, where you have the registration network learn from unlabeled images how you essentially augment the data, you can with very, very few images, like five or 10, learn a pretty decent segmentation network. And then the segmentation network can drive the registration. Then it can sort of like mutually reinforce itself. And you can do much better for these, um, for these uh, thin structures in this particular case. And I think for me, combining like deep learning with these types of models, I think these are the most more exciting directions, right? Because if you just take your plain old loss function and you make it faster by putting a um, um, uh, deep network in front of it, which we have done, right? So I'm criticizing myself, but this is sort of like gives you something faster, but not necessarily better. But if you push it towards creating some sort of additional information that you traditionally may not have, uh, then I think there's, there's a hope that you can outperform some of these more traditional methods and uh, that they are sort of like more nicely behaved because they focus on the regions that you think really should matter, or the algorithm figures out that they should matter. And then the last thing I'm going to uh, uh, just briefly state is that, of course, these models, they also have the ability to learn, in a sense, more non-traditional image similarity measures. right? And this can be done in different ways. And people have proposed different ways of doing this, some of them also with like with like GANs or, or like doing some sort of um, features uh, that, that are somehow deeper in the, in the neural network. But from, a, from the most primitive way of, of doing this, here's an example result of where we just had an image, a uh, set of images, brain images with T1 weighted and T2 weighted images. We trained the network. Uh, we basically, by optimization, computed um, what, in this particular case, initial momenta should be if you go a bit from a source to a target T1 weighted image. But then we trained the, the deep learning model to go across modalities. Right? And when, when you do this, then it sort of learns to, um, at the same time, accommodate for the differences in this image appearance. So essentially, it learns the image similarity. And it learns to predict the deformation all at the same time. And what you see here is sort of like the LDDMM registration result. And then is the prediction result where you went across modalities, so very different appearance. And it essentially looks, uh, looks very similar. So, Again, without going too much into detail here, I think another exciting aspect of these models is that there's an opportunity to, to learn something that's much more customized for the particular problem that you have, that really goes beyond these um, relatively simple models we used to have, because it's very difficult to write down something more customized if you don't learn it from the data. And with this, I think I'm going to stop one minute early, amazingly, <laughs> and I uh, have uh, time for questions. Thank you.